today's Finance Friday. On behalf of George Smith Partners and everyone on the panel here, I just want to thank you for taking an hour out of your day to listen to a bunch of guys chat. So hopefully it's interesting and we keep you uh, entertained. Um, we have some great guests today. We also have Ed. Just kidding. Ed, we're glad to have Ed as a, our, my co-moderator today. We're uh, George Smith Partners is uh, proud to be in the um, finance business. We've had a great year and uh, a challenging year. So uh, along with many of our clients this year, it's been a year of many decisions. And uh, we know that going into next year, there are plenty of new decisions to make and how to, how to put together your portfolio, your plan as a real estate owner and asset manager. And hopefully today we can uncover some interesting topics that uh, may help you as uh, you think about the world around you. We're going into uncharted territories, as they say. So first off, I'd like to introduce Eric Sussman. Eric has been a professor with UCLA Anderson's Graduate School of Management since 1995, where he's been voted outstanding professor 15 times by MBA students. Additionally, he's been named as one of the top 10 most popular business professors by Bloomberg Business Week and one of the 20 most influential professors alive today. Um, I don't know how much he paid for those accolades, but Eric is a founding partner of Clear Capital, a real estate investment firm that oversees the firm's capital, equity, and debt and strategic planning functions. Eric's past experience is broad and uh, varied and includes key positions at Amber Capital and Securia Real Estate Partners. Um, I was glad to have Eric as a professor at UCLA and uh, it's, it was my turn here to heckle him a little bit. So uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Ed. Great, thanks Evan. And it's my pleasure to inter introduce Tucker Hughes, who's co-founder and managing partner at Peregrine. Tucker's got a long background in real estate and I think many of you may know him as he helped build up very uh, impressive real estate business at Bank OZK, which is formerly the Bank of the Ozarks, where you know they assembled and created a great team and closed over 25 billion in real estate loans. After that, um, Tucker moved on and advised a Canadian pension fund for transitional loans. Then in his you know, impressive career here, he's also head of commercial real estate at Axos Bank. Um, very successful, and now he's out on his own. And we're going to let Tucker talk a little bit throughout this about what Peregrine's doing. And a funny side note: uh, I was with Tucker for his first time in South Beach at one of the conferences long ago when we worked on a deal. So we were probably not going to talk about that, but it's a funny side note. Let, let's not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, everyone. So, so COVID has caused a massive global printing of fiat currency. And you know, this is the numbers that I see in the news every day are unprecedented. So is CRE an inflationary hedge? And you know, we'll kick it off with a light topic. So I don't know, Eric, if you wanna try that one first or Tucker, but curious on your thoughts there. Well, there are only two of us. So that's, it's either me or Tucker. So I don't know, <laughs> I guess uh, you, you might email. And by the way, Evan, thank you for the, for the very kind introduction. I, I just would wanna add that Evan was one of the finest average students I've ever had in my 25 years. So, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, clear. You know, I, I, when people ask me that question all the time about uh, real estate as an inflation hedge. And I always respond, well, if you look at history, the answer is yes, but we haven't had any significant inflation, of course, in this country for uh, going on 40 years now. For those of us who remember bell-bottom jeans and uh, polyester pants and disco from the 70s. So we really haven't had significant inflation. And if you look at the yield curve since the late 70s, it's basically been you know, essentially downwards to we are, you know, where we are today. Having said that, look, um, I, I think it's like anything in real estate, it always is one of those, if it depends uh, what asset types you're talking about, of course, uh, how quickly your rents can adjust uh, to it, you know, for inflationary pressures. And I would also say what's driving the inflation. I mean, Evan, you prefaced your comment, your question with the, the printing press that Janet Yellen is inheriting. I sure would love to have that HP printer. Um, but you're right. I mean, it's an unprecedented uh, printing, and it really hasn't led to any uh, inflation thus far. My sense is we will have substantial inflation in 2022, when all this tremendous amount of currency sitting on the sidelines, money market funds remain at all-time highs, over $4 trillion. And that money 
uh, is been sort of waiting to come off the sidelines. And so I, I, I do see inflation happening. I think it's a question of which real estate type uh, we're, we're talking about. Um, probably, again, uh, if it's coupled with economic growth, I think, you know, multifamily assets, because their ability to raise rents more quickly, will probably uh, have quicker, uh, you know, uptick with adjustments from inflation, as opposed to, let's say, you've got some long-term triple net leases that are sort of locked in at rent rates. Uh, where their expenses might be increasing. But anyways, those are my thoughts. Tucker, I, I'm going to call on you. What do you, what do you. Tell me where I'm wrong. What do you, what do you think? <laughs> no, I think that's generally right. Um, I, I will say, I mean, I think it's important in these times to just acknowledge how strange these times re really are um, as sort of just a, a backdrop to any one of these discussions. I mean, everybody, right, rightfully so, jumps into the meat of certain topics. But, but the truth of the matter is, you know, interest rates are at the lowest they've been in recorded history, literally. I mean, 6,000 years of, of recorded history in some, at some level or another, uh, money is the cheapest that it's ever been. And in fact, um, I mean, I was talking to a buddy of mine last week and he said, you know, what does it do to a buyer if in the Netherlands you buy a house for a million dollars and the bank's writing you a check, not, not charging you, and so if you buy it for $2 million, you're actually receiving a larger check. I mean, that's not actually the, the whole point of that, but it, it does encourage some really, really wacky behavior. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, is real estate an inflation hedge is one very precise question that we can try to answer. But I think more importantly, um, nobody knows a damn thing about what's going on because we've never had this situation where Money's effectively free, so you're 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 almost for the first time ever encouraged to not take the money right now, which is just so contrary. I mean, every finance class in the world teaches you, you know, you know, money in your pocket today is more valuable than money in your pocket tomorrow. Well, negative or zero interest rates encourage you to actually not take the money now, and so it's um, it's driving a lot of really bizarre decisions um, that 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 make all of these analysis like just unprecedented and, and really, really difficult. Um, with, with that said, I agree generally, Eric, with what you said, um, it, just sort of given logic, but like everything's so illogical right now, it's really difficult. I mean, I, I, I jokingly told Evan and Ed yesterday and Eric as well, um, th this webinar is gonna be kind of funny because I, I don't think there's a right answer to anything you're going to ask. I mean, it's just such a strange time. So I did a good job of not answering your question directly, but I just, I think it's important to set the stage that like just how awkward this time really is in the entire history of tracking finance. So I'll stop there, but it's just, it's a, it's a crazy thing that we're, we're discussing. Yeah. Well, what do finance professors really know anyway? Right. I mean, <laughs> I'm a county more than I do, for sure. <laughs> By the way, Tucker, for the right, record, I just gave a final exam. So you said there could be any answer here. Let's be perfectly clear. When I'm grading these exams, there is an answer. So <laughs> no. Evan would have liked your answer because he used to give me off the wall answers to my questions. But you know. <laughs> I, I love it. I love it. And and also I should say thanks to Ed for introducing me. And and um, if I can take 30 seconds to just tell everybody what Peregrine is very yeah. briefly, I'd appreciate it. Uh, because we're new. So we we launched July 1st officially of this year. So very interesting timing to uh, to start a new uh, real estate, primarily debt-focused platform. Uh, but we have an institutional backer um, with a, a fairly large sum of money committed to us and a programmatic JV. And we're looking to raise additional money in 2021. Um, but we're looking for um, and we're probably going to have this question, you know, where should we be investing right now? And the answer is, hell, I don't know. But, but I'm trying to shift more into debt than equity. Um, Eric will tell you that there's some really good equity plays out there, I think, if you're smart enough to find them. Uh, but what Peregrine's focused on is primarily um, either rescue capital, regular MES financing for the right transactions, um, money that's needed quickly, um, and, and potentially large sums of money. Um, for projects that maybe short term are in some level of distress, but long term make complete sense. Um, and so we're, we're looking for check sizes of kind of 
30 million to 40 million on the down on the low side up to call it a couple hundred million would be a pretty large check for us. Um, and we're sort of mid teen um, and even up to high teen focus, just depending on sort of what we what we think the risk is, even though I just told you none of us can figure out the risk. But anyway, that's a little bit about Peregrine. And um, so, you know, look to us for MES, distressed debt, um, rescue capital, um, uh, whole loan quotes, uh, and stuff like that. There's my plug. Thank you. Yeah. Congratulations. It's, uh, it's exciting. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. So for, I think the next question and part of our topic here is, you know, when you think about asset classes coming out of COVID, I mean, hopefully we can see on the horizon the vaccine and, you know, at some point, what do you, what assets are you looking at that would perform, you know, the best coming out of this either, you know, not maybe the, is as obvious like the movie theaters or something like that, but, you know, kind of in your mind, what you think, you know, as you look forward, something you might be a little more scared about today, but as we see this COVID on the, on the sunset, hopefully, um, that will perform, you know, pretty strong coming out of this. Tucker, you want to start this one? Sure, sure. Um, well, so I'll answer this again with not really directly answering the question. I mean, it certainly obviously depends on your, your investment point. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're more of a a credit or a debt focused platform. And so we're really focused on sort of our last dollar of exposure, not suggesting that equity is not worried about basis. Um, but, you know, we really like finding um, particular opportunities where we think it's a high quality of life, um, preferably lower cost of living. Um, you know, I'm sitting here in Dallas, Texas, you know, Elon Musk is apparently moving to Austin or somewhere. Um, and a bunch of other people. And so, you know, I, I've, I've lived in Texas my whole life for the most part, spent a little time in California, but I, I think, um, you know, no state income taxes is, is important or, or just generally lower cost of living areas. Um, but if you can get into hotels that make sense um, at, a, at a reasonable basis, um, I, I certainly think they're coming back to mostly normal. Now, is that 90% of pre-COVID value or is it 70% or is it 99% or is it 110%? I don't know, which is why we kind of search for that margin of, of miss or margin of risk or margin of error um, being the, the debt piece of the capital structure. Um, I think single families are gonna do fantastic right now. Uh, I think the millennial generation is moving um, quite a bit right now from urban environments to suburban environments. Uh, but I don't think they have enough money to make the down payment in a lot of scenarios. So single family renters um, are becoming a very popular asset class. And, and you'll see that like San Francisco apartments have got what, 20% vacancy right now. Um, my guess is it doesn't stay that way, but who wants to be in these big cities during COVID? So the question is, are you looking at how do you make money in six months, 12 months, 10 years? You know, your investment horizon matters a lot. Um, but, but I think there's definitely plays uh, primarily in, in areas that are, uh, that are cheaper to live um, and, and that are still, uh, you know, have a quality lifestyle. Yeah, I think by and large, that, that's fair to say. Look, I, I agree with you, Tucker. Hospitality will recover more quickly. Ed, you mentioned movie theaters. If there was some way of investing in, in movie theaters, other than AMC will be filing bankruptcy. <laughs> right. Sure. So I'm not sure that's the place to play, but look, hospitality obviously did phenomenally well post financial crisis. If you can get fine distressed assets, and I don't play in that sandbox, Tucker, you may be closer to it. Um, look, obviously repurposing retail and office, there'll be some select plays. I think a, a tremendous amount of money will be made in that, in those, uh, in that space as well as lost. Uh, so it's a question of being selective and identifying those assets. And our firm doesn't play in that sandbox. We're, look, we're multifamily operators, and I am, have been a huge bull on multifamily for the last 20 years and continue to be because of just continued structural shifts in our housing. Um, and I do believe that right, if you look right now, there are plenty of headwinds and, and tailwinds in, in multifamily. Occupancy is still, phys, you know, physical occupancy is still fairly strong, you know, mid 90% nationally and, and should remain that way. Obviously, I would, I would avoid... And what we always have avoided is those markets on, which are overly dependent on single industries. I don't care if it's Midland, Texas, even Vegas makes me nervous, or Orlando, where you basically are playing 
housing as much as you are some underlying industries. So I would just be thoughtful about, about that. Obviously, um, Tucker mentioned demographic moves, people moving out of uh, California, New York daily. That trend has been going on for 10 years, uh, population moves. It's interesting, New York had, has benefited from immigration, mostly offsetting the, you know, the, the local people moving out of the, out of the state. California now is just in a terrible world of hurt as far as I'm concerned because our politicians are somewhere between moronic and idiots, uh, frankly. <laughs> and, I mean, I, you know, and I, I don't mind calling it as I see it. And we're going to continue to see those demographic outflows from, you know, Boise, Idaho, all the way down into, into areas of Texas, uh, Colorado, Arizona, uh, as people seek you know, more affordable housing um, and just, you know, perhaps more favorable politics and everything else. Uh, that's happening. So I, I'm still very bullish on that right now. Construction starts in apartments are going to be way down in 2021. Uh, I think to some degree that'll be a, give some uh, supply cushion. And all those 20 somethings living at your house, including I got two of them in my house. I wish they weren't here. I'm supposed to be an empty nester. Total disaster there. Uh, they'll be renters. And, and as soon as they're gone, when I get to Kick them the hell out of here, go renters. And I imagine there's you know three million plus of them across this country that will be renting in the next you know say 12 to 24 months. Hopefully, when things get back to uh, to normal. So those are my quick quick views. Okay, Anna. So um, maybe before we we uh, we have a question here, you know, kind of written out that's a little bit more esoteric, but I think it'd be kind of apropos to, to talk a little bit about a little bit more about this discussion here. And, and specifically potentially about the single family rental business. Ed uh, owns another a company that does this business as well. Um, Ed, do you wanna share anything about the demographic trends that, that you are looking at there? Yeah, I mean, I think we see, you know, the two big demographic waves are obviously millennials reaching the childbearing household formation years. Then you have obviously seniors um, and, and both of those waves, you know, in an undersupplied housing market, um, you know, are looking, I think, also for a no maintenance lifestyle, you know, buying a starter home. I think a lot of people look at a starter home and buying it is not their dream home. They'd rather rent that and then move up into something that's, you know, more, uh, more practical. And then, you know, for seniors, you know, you shouldn't be making, you know, people say make a long term investment in real estate. Well, when you're when you're 60 or 70, maybe that's not the best time to make a long term investment um, and you should rent. Uh, so we think those demographic waves, and a lot of it's around cost. Uh, the cost of multifamily has gone up per unit. And so the relative difference between building single family for rent or townhome product, which right doesn't have commercial code, doesn't have sprinklers, doesn't have ADA, has really narrowed that. And that crossover of cost and these demographic waves and slightly larger families have really led to an ex pretty much explosive growth into the SFR. Um, and I think there's a lot of capital and a lot of opportunities and a lot of different ways to attack, attack it in terms of product. So fairly exciting. Uh, I don't know, Tucker, Eric, if you have a comments on that or we can kind of. Yeah. No, it's interesting. One of my business school classmates, uh, Gary Beasley is CEO of Roofstock. So, uh, you know, you're absolutely right, Ed. I mean, it, and I, I think you hit, hit it on, on, on the head. Um, look, I would say just a couple other factors to think about, you know, underwriting for single family is tough. Tucker talked about that, right? I mean, how many people have 30, you know, let's say traditional mortgage 20% down in most markets to in cash, certainly the millennials, they don't. And, and I think so it gives them sort of the, the best of both possible worlds and, and flexibility. Look, millennials, Gen Zers, let's say, I don't know what's after them. But, you know, I, I talk about labor mobility, you know, this idea that, you, you know, let's say our parents or, you know, that's a uh, generation worked for a single company for their entire career until they got a pension, might have retired. I mean, those days are so gone. And so when you stop, if you're a 20 something, 30 something now, and you're starting a family, Ed, as you pointed out, you know, you want flexibility. You want to tie yourself down for five years to a single family home and, the, you know, all those costs that go along with it. You know, um, flexibility is really important. So I, I think you, you hit the nail on the head. And I see those those trends being really long term and structural as opposed to uh, cyclical. Interesting. So um, I guess let's switch gears here a little bit. And uh, you know, I, I've heard I, I heard a, earlier this week BlackRock on a on a um, another webinar saying that interest rates they think interest rates are going to go up 
to 1.1 to 1.25 next year, somewhere in there, still makes commercial real estate an interesting investment, especially with the influx of equity capital out of the bond markets into the, equi the public equities market it, and probably also trickling into the real estate market. So the question is, what does that do to cap rates? We kind of talked about this at the beginning, but maybe we should do some predictions here. And uh, where are cap rates at the end of 2021 and 2022? I, I'm, I'm famous for dodging and actually not answering questions. But I, <laughs> I, I'm happy to do that again. I mean, look, um, I, I do think there's going to be some pressure just because of all the money for, for some level of inflation. We, we need you know, real demand to keep up with, with this inflation. Um, and, and so, you know, will interest rates, you know, rise? I mean, I think if, that's like saying, um, look, in 2026, how many hurricanes are going to hit the Gulf? Uh, you know, I mean, I have no earthly idea where interest rates are going, or I'd be a whole lot wealthier than I am. Um, once again, I'll, I'll say the same thing. That's why I like being the debt and having a cap on our interest rate. But, um, I think that there's enough money out there and enough reason to believe that probably um, rates will push higher in the in the reasonable near term. Um, it, you know, is it flying off the shelf to 15%? I don't think so. Um, but but you know, if they go down, well, well, I guess they'll just pay us all to own our homes, as I said previously. So. Um, I really don't know the answer. It feels like they're going to stay, they're going to stay pretty low for a while. But Eric will give you the the real professor answer to what oh, you know, God, you know, it, it's it's a funny thing. I remember I was moderating a panel at our Think Center of Finance a few years ago with some very sophisticated, uh, you know, bond folks, fixed income folks, and I asked that question, Evan, whether rates were going higher in whatever year it was, 2018. And of course, everyone got it wrong. And in fact, the Wall Street Journal did a survey of something of the 50 top economists a couple of years ago and what they thought was going to happen with rates. And every single one was wrong. So let, you know, let's be clear about, about that. It's, it, and also, you look, the 10 years are what, at 0.9 now? So it jumped to 1.1. I mean, that's, that's not a prediction. That's like with a range of you know, movement. So I mean, that's, that's one of those, if, Black, if BlackRock actually said we're in a 1.1 possibly or 1.2, that's not a prediction. That's sort of just within the range of what might be a normal move from here. I, I agree with actually you, Tucker, uh, with the supply of money, and you talked about that. Um, you know, and, and Jerome Powell, and you know, when he last spoke, they said they're not. They've changed their the way they're uh, interest rate targeting. It's they want a little more inflation, so they said they are not going to raise rates as quickly as they did in the past. So I think rates are going to trade in this narrow range for the foreseeable future as I can see it. And cap rates, Evan, again, it's headwinds and tailwinds. There's a lot of liquidity out there. So they'll be making demands for assets which will keep those cap rates uh, suppressed. So whatever upward pressure there might be in rates will be offset and it'll be, it'll be a good, it'll be, it'll be uh, Mike Tyson and uh, Roy <laughs> Jones, a standoff, ugly and a draw. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. All right. Okay, so um, next next question. One of the interesting things we're talking about low rates um, and the printing press. Well, you know the Federal Reserve owns over two trillion of Fannie and Freddie securities, which is just somewhat of a staggering number. We keep throwing around trillions, and you forget that is a staggering number. Um, and so this has obviously caused a housing boom because mortgage rates are at their lowest levels ever. Uh, multifamily, or you know, George Smith was seeing, you know, our borrowers getting insanely low rates that you know we've never seen before. So, you know, at the same time, we have a political change in the White House. Um, and what does it, you know, between restructuring Fannie and Freddie and maybe taking them out of conservative ship, or if they stop buying securities or selling securities, do you, does this cause you to lose sleep or or worry about it? I mean, at some point, it, something's going to change. Tucker, you might be closer to this than I am. I have my views, but why don't you start with this one? And uh, I was actually going to volley it to you, given you're the multi-family guy. Um, but all right, well, if you want to, either way, you want to eeny, meeny, miny, mo. You want to? No, no, no. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to start. I, I guess. I mean, I, I, I think. Look, that, that's a, that's a bigger risk than I'm able to um, really evaluate. But I will tell you that um, we 
I feel like I'm just beating the same drum. I mean, we want to underwrite to, to debt yield numbers that would work um, if Freddie and Fannie were no longer uh, sort of, uh, in my opinion, sort of artificially creating value, so to speak, um, by, by issuing debt on projects that otherwise wouldn't be financed in the same fashion. So um, we actually aren't as bullish multifamily, even though it's a longstanding, fantastic investment and has done well for many, many people. Um, because, we, we, I mean, that's a big risk. I mean, if Freddie and Fannie make a drastic change, it, it could impact um, future financing and cap rates and the, the view on a lot of sectors of multifamily um, that we just don't feel comfortable understanding. And so we want to underwrite to a debt yield that does not require a Freddie or Fannie execution. But beyond that, I honestly think Eric's probably better qualified to, to think through some other stuff. Thank you, Doug. I mean, look, obviously you're right. We, we do live in the Fannie Freddie world with our financing. I just read that they've, uh, they just came out with their uh, expected caps for next year, 70, 70 billion each, just slightly down from this year, which was 80. So we're talking 140 billion of, of financing, which is pretty much on par. I don't see it. You know, look, they've been talking about these changes and restructuring of Fannie and Freddie for how many years now? I mean, we're talking post-financial crisis now. So at some point, I think it's clear that it's sort of, again, a political stalemate. We're going to, you know, look, I don't know what's going to happen in Georgia, but most of us think we're going to have more stalemate. And, and, and so we're going to have another four years of, you know, nothing happening. Um, so I don't see any major changes there. And um, I don't think any politician wants to maybe tackle that, that right. challenge, right? Who's going to be the one to really take on Fannie and Freddie, <laughs> given that housing is, what, 13 or 14 percent of our GDP? Yeah, so, and growing. Yeah, I mean, I agreed. So I, I think it's a uh, status quo as far as I can see. Okay. Um, just looking through our, our topics here, let's let's switch it up a bit. Uh, let's talk about the Airbnb IPO. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, let's. Yeah, I don't know if you guys saw that or not. If you didn't, that's, that's fine, but we'll let Ed talk about it if you didn't. But I don't know. Um, you know, pretty, pretty staggering um, in the middle of this, uh, you know, crisis to have a large IPO like that and for it to perform the way it did. And another indicator of just the strange behaviors of people and, and, and whatnot. But uh, Eric, you're shaking your head. So we'll yeah. let you go first here. Yeah, yeah. This is one where I don't, if you don't mind, I really have thoughts on this because of course, I, you know, as you know, Evan, I don't only teach real estate, I teach accounting and equity, our equity valuation courses. So look, when I see DoorDash and Airbnb go public and their valuations go beyond any rational measure, uh, I, I know many of us on this call are old enough to remember 99. I haven't seen this kind of IPO action since then and I'm getting nervous, okay? Airbnb, at, at, even as of today, I think it was pretty much flat from yesterday, its market cap exceeds the sum of every publicly traded hotel, okay? <laughs> Now, if any of you here can give me a spreadsheet to justify that, I'll give you an A plus automatically. <laughs> okay. I mean, so right, and we, and we remember that it's just it's it's funny money, it's nuts. But that isn't to say, look, Airbnb um, has actually it's interesting. In March, when COVID first hit, got decimated, tremendous number of cancellations, and then what's happened since then is all of the remote workers and remote students now that have kind of flooded uh, the market and now have really helped Airbnb sort of recapture and actually do quite well. Um, but it is so overvalued, Evan, as an equity. And I, and, and I don't want to get um, you know, off topic, but that is actually what I consider to be the biggest risk, even in real estate in our, in our financial markets. 20% of the Russell 2000 are essentially zombie companies. And if it weren't for the largesse of the capital markets, they probably would not be in existence or would certainly be at far lower valuations where they are. And that makes me nervous again, because history may not repeat itself, but it rhymes and many of us know that. And, and it, you know, these young people, they, they're trading on Robinhood. I mean, they're, they're nuts, right? They have no experience, right? I mean, they don't know what they're doing and that's, they'll learn, they're gonna learn the hard way. So that's, I think it makes me nervous. I think Airbnb models is fine. It's terribly overvalued. I'm not saying you should short it unless you want to stand up for the freight train, but um, you know, it's, 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 it makes me nervous. Tucker or Ed? 
I want to hear Ed's opinion. I, I think it's all hype and it's vastly overvalued. But I, I mean, beyond that, I don't have anything. I mean, Eric is right. Um, but, you know, money's free right now. So why don't you toss it at Airbnb? I mean, yeah, I uh, well, both my kids have Robinhood accounts just for learning purposes. And they're like, this is so easy. It just keeps going up. And so the lesson has not been learned yet, but I think it's coming. Um, and I think we see this everywhere. You know, my, uh, my partner, here, Evan, drives a Tesla. Uh, I don't know if it justifies the 600 billion market cap of Tesla. Or we see SPACs. I mean, I think every time you look at when SPACs go nuts, you know, you really don't want to be in equities the following couple of years after that because it's a sign of speculation. Um, so I think it's an interesting world today in, in valuation. <laughs> but when rates go to so low, you know, that spreadsheet, you know, I mean, if rates go to zero, you know, on certain finance, right, models that equity should be worth a gazillion dollars. So um, it's, it's interesting times, but I, I'm old enough uh, to, to recall the, uh, some of these bubbles. So I'm probably skeptical on some of this personally. I have to add on to that, Ed, because I'm so glad you mentioned SPACs because I'm gonna be teaching SPACs in my advanced accounting course. And you're right. What I would say is even more general to everybody. And this may be, sound like I'm on my teaching, my UCLA Anderson soapbox, but you're, Ed, you hit the nail on the head. When you start seeing new fangled vehicles that are just sort of off the beaten track and they're just, I don't care if it's tracking stocks, if those of you remember tracking yeah. stocks or these sort of things, you know, it, it is time to, to really you know, put on the warning signals. And I, and I hear you, Ed, on, on, and, and Tucker, both of you on, on where, you know, zero interest rates can make models look great. But what did Billy Preston say? Nothing from nothing is nothing. So, I mean, you know, that's the denominator. You still got the numerator problem. If these business models don't make money, I don't care what the discount rate is. It still doesn't make any freaking sense. And they rely on the, again, the capital markets to fund their cash flow deficits. That is just, I mean, it's not sustainable. Uh, yeah. It's a question of when that shoe drops. I think it's interesting when you, I think JP Morgan raised their Tesla price target to 90, which is hilarious when the stock's trading at 600, right? It's just a, uh, it's a very, very odd world when that happens. Again, just real quick, sorry, one data point. So Tesla at its market cap now is worth two thirds of the sum of every single publicly traded auto company in the world. Wow. Every single publicly traded automaker in the world, we're talking Toyota, Daimler, Benz, VW, all of them. Tesla's market cap is two thirds the sum total of all of them. Interesting. So, so was, wasn't November like the, the hottest month in a decade for stocks or something? I, I have no earthly idea. Uh, I, as November was the best November on record, I think. Yeah. Best November and maybe best month in 10 years or something. I, I, I don't know. It was, it was an interesting stat and I was scratching my head on, I, I didn't go buy a bunch of stock in November. <laughs> so back on the SPAC thing though, for just one second though, and this is a kind of a question for, for Ed and, and Eric. So a lot, you know, what is the name? Chalma Palahaptia, the social capital guy. You know, he's got a couple of the largest SPACs. He would tell you that, you know, he's taking the bubble out of venture capital and bringing companies to the public markets earlier, so the public markets <laughs> can can uh, can benefit from what uh, um, uh, you know the big returns that that venture capital can provide, rather than you know capitalizing companies to like Series F with these giant you know follow-on rounds like Airbnb and uh, WeWork. They got you know, they drug it out forever in the, in the private markets. So he, he, his, his view is let's, let's bring that to everybody. What are your, what are your thoughts there? If you're going to be opening a class on this topic. So, so you're arguing for let's dem democratize bubbles. No, I, mean, I, I don't know. I, I'm just curious. I mean, that's look, his argument I mean, is that. You know, I know him well. I, I, of course he, I, I'm, I get his Twitter feed. I mean, he inhales a lot of California herb clearly. I mean, <laughs> Look, I mean, and yeah, and not kale for the record. That might be going out a little rough. You know, look, the, I, I, so he's one of them, social capital. You may have heard of him. I, I, I'm very careful about pointing out specific you know, names of companies, but ARK Investment, one of the hottest funds right now. Right. Would, you know, again, it, 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 Evan, that makes me nervous because you're basically going at least arguably from an accredited investor, sophisticated investor, sort of, well, a venture capitalist. 
to the markets and, and Ed and my kids and Tucker, maybe your kids and Evan, your, well, your, your child is too young. Actually, Robin Hood will take your one-year-old's account, by the way. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, that's, that scares the hell out of me. Let's democratize bubbles and make it easier for people to make really, really bad investment decisions. Uh, but I'll let, I'd love to hear from you guys. Ed, I don't know. Do you have any comments there? I mean, I think, you know, I think some of these companies going public probably before their time is probably not the best idea always. Um, so, I, you know, it's, it's interesting that bringing these out and, you know, look, it, it, you can make the argument, it's really just private equity, right? In a single shot where the investors get a vote, right? If you're in a SPAC, you get a vote. So you can make that argument. Um, it's just there's so many of them now and the valuations are stretched that it's, that it's, uh, I, I, would, I would advise caution at all times. Okay. Um, so why don't we skip down a bit here? I'm looking through our, our kind of our topics. Let's talk about, let's switch gears again. Let's talk a little bit about a recent deal that you guys worked on or did in the real estate markets that you really liked and, and why? Because we've talked a lot about hypothesizing about, well, where you want to be, you know, Eric's bullish on multifamily and Tucker isn't, and Tucker is bullish on debt, and, and Eric isn't. So let's hear, it. Tucker, you go first. Talk about a deal that you liked. You can use, you know, if you can't talk specifically about it, use some uh, modifiers, but, you know, and what, what, what was compelling about it? Because, you know, both of you guys are in the business of making investments right now. Uh, so, so what's interesting? Well, it's, it's for, for us, um, we started July, we've quoted a bunch of deals um, and, and it's a very competitive space for what we're, what we're doing right now. But um, like I said earlier, I mean, what, what we're looking for is um, good sponsorship. Um, you know, I'd probably finance Eric's multifamily. He seems like he'd probably be a pretty good sponsor if he'd take my money, but it's probably too expensive for him. But, uh, but good sponsors that have, you know, real value or equity um, you, you know, in front of my position uh, in markets where we truly feel like we can pin a value or a range of values. Um, I mean, Evan, you and I worked closely on a transaction that may or may not come to fruition. Um, I won't say anything specifically about it, but, um, you know, being able to, to comp the asset and then um, come up with try to bake down the, the variables as much as you can to come up with sort of a range of outcomes that you think not just completely outlandish. Um, but we, we admit that we cannot peg value right now. And I, and I think anybody that tells you they can absolutely hit value, you, you know, to the, to the square foot or to the dollar is, is frankly just a liar. Um, but, you know, we just talked about it. Interest rates might go up. Um, so what do you do there? That, that impacts cap rates, it impacts value. So what we're trying to do is find um, good sponsors with equity above us that um, have a reason to protect their asset and that want a partner that wants to come in and just provide a financial solution and, and stay out of the way. Um, so I can't speak specifics um, about, about assets, but that's what we're looking for. And, and we do want to look in the, the quality of life markets and, and we want to look in areas generally where, um, you know, if it's expensive to live there, it's really worth it, or it's a lower lower cost area. I mean, as far as assets, we can go through all of them if you if you want. I mean, uh, we're looking at some office deals. We're in fact in Dallas right now, where I'm sitting. There's um, there's a lot of vacancy. There's a lot of sublease space. It's um, it's troubling to say the least. And so what they're doing is they're changing. Um, they being developers in general and buyers are changing the supply side of the equation by actually taking office buildings and converting several floors of an office building into multifamily. Um, I was actually talking to my wife about it. I said, does anybody want to live in downtown Dallas? I mean, I, I certainly don't, but apparently younger folks do um, that don't have big families. And so if you can change the supply side, then or repurpose the asset, then that could also make, make some sense. So um, you can find office deals that are being repurposed. You can find hotels that fundamentally are sound that are just cash starved because of COVID. Um, and then you, you can find the occasional multifamily development deal that also makes sense. But we look for, we look for big projects. And so uh, holding, holding a minimum check size in the mez slot or a whole loan of 
40, 50 million, you know, we're not doing stuff uh, up in Van Isles or, or Wiley, Texas or something. We're, we're mainly in the main, uh, the, the smiley face of the country in, in major metros for the most part. Okay, Eric, interesting um, deal. Yeah, you, you know, we were actually fairly quiet. I agree with what Tucker said. I mean, underwriting is, is no easy feat these days. And so we didn't do any deals for the first uh, eight months of the year. And now we closed on one in Lakewood, Colorado, outside of Denver. We got uh, two pending, one in Carrollton, Texas, outside Dallas, and another um, uh, here in, in Southern California. Uh, you know, what I, what I would say is the underwriting is, is challenging. Um, I, I like, look, I like those markets outside of California where people are headed, but sort of secondary to those sort of uh, markets that have been very popular. So if you look at, let's say, uh, the Denver, Phoenix, Dallas, I mean, wherever markets have been really hot, looking outside from there, actually. Uh, so sort of bedroom communities um, outside of those particular cities. But look, you know, are we got an underwriting team of three at Clear Capital, and they're underwriting you know seventy deals a week, and it's it's tough because the numbers just don't make sense. And sellers really haven't repriced. I mean, they haven't come to come to uh, you know what fill in the blank there, but you know to to really reprice their assets. So we have to sort of kiss a lot of frogs, and uh, we've done a lot of frog kissing this year. Um, but I do like those deals. I, I love apartments. I still think in the right markets, absolutely, those, that's the future. And we're, look, we're, we're five to seven year investors. We're not, I'm not looking for what's going to happen in you know, the next six months. I have to look longer term than that. So um, you can look on our website and see what we like. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll, I will add one thing. I mean, it's interesting. Um, and I, I think probably everybody on this uh, shares this view, but I don't know that. We're, we're tracking special servicers and we're tracking banks um, to see where help might be needed um, and capital might be needed. And, um, you know, I, I worked at Bank of the Ozarks, as Ed said, and Axos Bank in San Diego. Um, and, and so have a lot of friends there and can talk to them, um, you know, as much as I want. And, and I certainly expected that, well, well I'll just say I, I've, I've been wrong so much this year. I mean, I, I thought by, you know, August or September, um, you know, it'd be, the bid ask spread would close and people would recognize. I thought my asset was worth X, but it's worth Y. And, and in fact, Y might be currently levered above 100 percent. And so I've got a real problem. Um, but the uh, regulatory environment has not made the lenders uh, and therefore the, the borrowers, um, you know, come to the table and, and recognize and sort of reset value for everybody, um, which, you know, certain people would say is a fantastic thing. If, if you're in my particular business, you're, you're ready for everybody to sort of take their licks for whatever bad investments they made or come get help from places like me that want to go lend them money that, that allows them to to keep their asset, uh, maybe at a more pay painful interest rate, but uh, but everything's been just sort of stretched out to the point where now it's like people say, well, when, when is this, you know, all these deferrals and forbearances and all, all of these devices that are allowing people to just sort of pretend nothing's going on, when is this going to stop? And, and I, I started saying the election thinking, my God, I, I have to be safe. If I just, mid-November, the, the banks can't be doing this. Well, it's still going on. And so, um, you know, is 2021 going to provide some V recovery? And then, you know, we really did just extend straight through it or, or it is, you know, blood about to leak out onto the streets. I don't know the answer, but um, we sure thought third and fourth quarter, we were going to be much more active and people have been able to just sort of hang on. So. Tucker, actually, I have a question for you following up on that, because I'm curious, because I think and someone actually chimed in, I saw in the chat, and I agree, isn't, again, you sort of hit the nail on the head, that the banks, because the bank's balance sheets generally are in decent shape, by and large, coupled with the Fed's not forcing their hand, that the amount of distress deals, if that continues, it's just either, I don't know, it's kicking the can down the road indefinitely, or it's just, we're not going to, the, the economy recovers post, you know, COVID, and so it just, 
it just doesn't materialize. I mean, again, many of us remember the 89 to 92 situation and the RTC in those days. And then even in the, you know, the, the Great Recession, in my world, multifamily, the special services were pretty quiet. There wasn't much in the way of, of foreclosures in, in multifamily. And now it's even, you, you're not seeing very much at all. So is it just because again, Fed action and banks balance sheets are in decent shape now? That they're yeah, not- Yeah, that, that, that's a great question, Eric. And, and, um, and generally, I think you said it exactly right. There's just, you could paint a picture where we wander around for the next 12 months or so and, and the inaction of institutions to, to force people to, uh, to recognize their obligations, you, you might not really see um, how bad it was because it, you know, values change all the time. I mean, we could sort of just muddle through this and, and nothing really shows up near to the volume that you would expect. On the other hand, um, banks are in great shape because banks, um, my early Ozarks days, we were quoting deals at say um, 70 to 80% leverage, um, you know, often with recourse, but I mean, we, we were way higher leverage. And I realized Bank of the Ozarks is publicly traded. So I'm talking about stuff way in the past, but, but I will tell you that they've delevered by many percentage points along with all the other banks, they've just made a, a huge effort to delever, but somebody else gave the leverage up and it was at a higher cost. And, and that's the debt funds. And, and so um, if they utilized underlying leverage in a major way, then you can see the impact through a cross collateralization and margin calls and things that debt funds might be unwinding their portfolios because their underlying lenders are the ones that are levered, not the single asset lending banks where I used to work. So you're seeing some of it in the debt fund space that took deals back up to 80, 85%. But yes, I think that there's certainly some truth to the fact that, that banks are just sort of allowing maybe us to go through a dip and then recover and maybe we don't see as much. But, you know, time will tell. I, I don't know anything. <laughs> well, we have seen appraisals. We have seen appraisals have some hiccups where they're more conservative um, on their assumptions. And that has caused some, you know, challenges on certain deals. So that is out there as well. I, I saw a couple of appraisals while I was working at a bank that literally said value and then COVID impact, negative 20%, and then post-COVID value. I, I, I mean, that's a hell of a way to value something. Yeah, that's so when George Smith Partners I, earns their fee. I mean, so, <laughs> you know, but, but I... I I agree with you, appraisals can mess up banks. And so that is, you know, in a maturity situation, if you need an appraisal to extend and it shows that you're way out of whack, that will cause either a, a mark by the regulators and a classification of the loan, or you got to move it. And so, and look, we've seen some note sales, but it's it's 10% of what I expected or some tiny fraction. Ed, do you want to grab the next question here or should we get one from the audience? There's some questions. Do, you, you want to grab one from the audience here? Sure. Let's see. Got to figure out how to do that. Um, Hang on, just on the chat button. All right, right here we go. So uh, here, here's a good one from Chris Cortez. Uh, where do you see the real estate as a service, co-working, co-living business going post COVID? Good question. Who wants to take that one? Well, I mean, I'll say 30 seconds and I'll, and I'll be quiet. I mean, I think co-living- so Wait, 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 Tucker. 30 seconds and you'll be quiet. You have <laughs> 30 seconds at one shot. You must be, sorry, keep going. No. I'm, I'm tired you, right now. You, Go. You, you want more or less from me? I can't even tell. <laughs> uh, look, I think co-living um, was a way to make living cheaper. Um, and, and so uh, as people move out of, you know, the urban core and the suburban, I, I would think um, the co-living would be a less attractive investment um, profile. But Eric, Eric can answer this question better. <laughs> that was 26 seconds, Tucker. <laughs> God, well done. I, you, 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 you won the challenge. You know, well, actually, Tucker, you, you're right, though. I mean, a, a lot of it has to do with just housing costs and, and young folks willing to sort of sacrifice amenities and other things to live in higher density, smaller units. Look, micro units. Uh, so as a general notion, look, 
I think we have to all sort of bifurcate the COVID from sort of longer term trends. You know, look, the COVID situation will end and, and, and presumably with the vaccines, hopefully enough folks take it and all that, I'll leave that for another day. But, you know, let's say by end of summer, third quarter, whenever it all ends up. So you're looking at 2022, and I think then you just have the, the same trends that we've seen sort of just start to rever- you know, come back. I don't think young people are gonna flee the urban cores permanently. That's still where the bars and, and Live Nation events are going to be. Uh, unless the Staples Center is relocating to Rancho Cucamonga, I know, you know, <laughs> You know, that changing. It's just, okay, it's temporary. I think like, oh, another opportunity, like New York housing, it will come back. I mean, some of us remember the 70s and the vacancies in New York City in the 70s. It'll come back. It's just a question of time. But I do think those those longer term shifts are real towards smaller units, uh, co-living. The biggest impediment that I see, frankly, are the politicians and them actually permitting and giving the, the green light to some of these higher density uh, micro units giving relief on parking requirements and the rest of it, which politicians just seem very reluctant to do in any kind of uh, size, you know, reasonable size, other than the urban core, because that's makes sense to me. Um, so I, I, I see by 2022 the same trends we saw uh, persisting. Okay, actually, let's 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 talk a little bit about the co-working question that he had because his his question was co-living and co-work. So obviously, you know, oh. there are some uh, office bears out there who are very convinced that, you know, no one's ever going to go back to an office again. And then there are people like me with a three-year-old and a one-year-old who's, <laughs> you know, I can't, I need to get to the office. So, um, you know, the question was real estate as a service, which kind of implies, uh, you know, the uh, asset light business model that, you um, we've seen kind of fall apart, but does anyone have uh, comments on, on those two topics? I'll, I'll just chime in real quickly. T- Tucker, time me, 30 seconds. Um, just that I, I told my MBA students graduating in the spring that I could not see employers paying them really good six-figure salaries so that they could work at home. I mean, we're, we're social creatures to solve complicated business problems requires networking and collaboration. And so again, sure, there'll be some transition period over maybe it's 12 to 18 months, but I'm, I'm, we're going to be back to somewhat normal. There may be some changes within the office and this and that, but I, it, look, people say that all the time, we're going to be permanent changes and it just doesn't, it doesn't play out that way. So um, I, I, I- Is this accelerating any macro changes though? Eric? Well, sure. I mean, of course, that's what the, look, there were trends, the demographic shifts uh, again, and, and, and COVID exacerbated them. But I think that's um, short, short lived uh, overall. Okay. Um, so I guess the answer is yes, people will be back in the office. So to answer the question on co-working, it depends if operators can find a model that where they can have a strong enough balance sheet to weather per- temporary dislocations in the market. When you say co-working, you're talking like we work models? Yeah, that's what I think the question was. I mean, you know, okay. I mean, th- those will come back as well. But again, their valuation was so ridiculous. I, I mean, again, <laughs> SoftBank must have clearly been looking at a very early version of Excel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm operating in a co-working environment now. And um, I, I can tell you that uh, Dallas, Texas is not strictly adhering to any COVID policies. Um, and so you can come to the office if you want. You can do kind of whatever you want here, the wild, wild west, if you will. But um, I've been coming back to the office for six months now, and um, the floor is pretty large. I mean, I would guess there's 50 or 60 tenants on this floor. Um, I, I only know of two other offices that have anybody that shows up. So uh, the the actual real occupancy of this space right now is I don't know five percent uh, or something. Uh, but my guess is that almost everybody else is paying. But I, I don't I don't I don't know that. Interesting. All right, Ed, do you want uh, one more question came in? Yeah, one more question. Yeah, manufactured housing, manufactured homes. Any any comments there? Yeah, I don't play in that sandbox really. Um, Ed, Tucker, you guys have more manufactured home space? Not in any material. No, I mean, 
if this keeps going on with COVID, I think I'm going to try and move into one. But besides that, um, I'm not sure I can wait long enough for New York to come back um, with my condo price. Oh, um, uh, he says manufactured home communities. Yeah, I figure so, like RV parks, uh, yeah. you know, those sorts of things. Um, uh, look, we owned one RV park in, in Beaumont uh, between 2010 and 2012. Thought we'd get into that space and end up sort of not going forward with it. I think those trends by and large are going to probably mirror the multifamily space. I think there's probably some good opportunity and, and, and all that and aging baby boomers and this and that. But again, I, I, that's where I, I don't play enough in that sandbox to really comment and I'm going to be careful. Got it. A whole bunch more questions coming in and we have a couple more minutes. So uh, um, let's see, modular technology. Tucker, this is kind of interesting for you as a lender, do you want to just talk just for a moment on what it means to finance modular construction? Not, not really. Okay. I'm just kidding. <laughs> now, um, look, I mean, we're sensitive to modular construction. In, in one regard, it's pretty amazing what they've done. They, they can build something that's more accurate than anything built by actual people um, as far as, you know, to, to the exact you know, millimeter and all that kind of thing. And, and it's actually very good product uh, as far as the one or two deals that I did finance when I was at a bank. Um, it, it can be done. There's some real sensitivity about the actual physical location of your collateral at any given moment um, because you're sort of spending a lot of money off site. And so then, you, you know, your insurance is different. Um, and the fact that, frankly, a lot of your materials are not being stored in your control for a period of time until, frankly, it's, it's effectively built. And then they show up at your site and, you know, an hour later it's built. You know, they just put the pieces together. And so from a financing perspective, you, you feel a little bit more nervous about your collateral position until it's secured on the property. Um, but outside of that, I, I've had very positive experiences with it. But, but yeah. I've financed that we've too. You know, a number of these companies that manufacture the actual componentry are venture are, are backed by private equity. And so we've started to see those private equity backers come in and help finance some of that yep. uh, to create some liquidity there for people. I think that's an interesting trend to explore going forward. So whoever asked, asked that question, go talk to your, um, go talk to the, 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 the folks that are uh, backing whoever you're talking to about building the components. Um, can I, can I add just one quick thing to that, Evan? Yeah. It has to do with you know zoning and people in, in uh, you know in plan check and the rest of it. Yep. This is the thing too is right. I've heard about modular housing. I mean, I can't tell you for so long, I, and I'm curious. And again, I don't purport to be an expert in the area, but I think a lot of it has to do with just you know building codes. They move at a glacial pace, and so approving new technologies and new ways of building, even though we probably all might agree that it's going to accelerate things and probably reduce the cost of construction and all that. And yet these bureaucrats, I mean, they just move so glacially that that's been an impediment, I think, to some degree. And if you guys have some way of getting rid of that roadblock, well, please email me ASAP. <laughs> I think there's a few topics that you'd like to, to use that same. Yeah. All right. So let's wrap it up, Ed. Do you have any final remarks here? No, I appreciate the, the time and the thoughts and uh, it's going to be interesting times and uh, we look forward to getting rid of 2020. That's for sure. Right, Evan? And uh, moving right. on to 2021. Yep. So thank you guys both, uh, Tucker and Eric. I don't know if you guys have anything you'd like to say, but we appreciate you guys coming on um, and uh, looking forward to next time. Appreciate the invite. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I, I echo the same sentiments. Thank you. And, and it's interesting. There's no lack of interesting things to talk about. And uh, let's, let's do it again. <laughs> let's do it. All right. All right. All right. Nice, nice to meet you, Eric. Thanks, guys. All, Thanks. All of you. Pleasure. Be Thank healthy. You. God bless everyone. Have, happy Bye -bye. holidays. Monica. Thank you. However you spell it. <laughs> all right. Thanks. <laughs>